The Evening Express and Evening Mail reported the following on June 11th, 1903. Quote, Two directors of the Fresne Shipping Company, to which the Liban belonged, were present. One of them, Mr. Alfred Fresne, came forward and, speaking with great emotion, said that this was not the time to discuss the responsibility for the loss of life, but that he courted full inquiry. He could only deplore the calamity and express his deep sorrow. A spectator here exclaimed, This is the first time we have seen this assassin weeping over his victim's coffins. Hello, and welcome to the Shipwreck Archive. Thank you. Would you happen to have the story, The Fatal Meeting of Liban and Insular? Here we are. Enjoy! The Liban was a 2,308-ton three-masted schooner-rigged steamship owned by the Fresne Steamship Company. She had been built in 1882 and was used for a regular route between Marseille and Bastia, Corsica, for the company, carrying both passengers and mail. The mail contract between Marseille and Corsica was a valuable government-subsidized route for the Fresnay Company, leading to a good deal of traffic by the Fresnay Company between the two places. The Liban on the Corsica route was just one of a fleet of 18 ships that the Marseille-based company owned in 1903, and their ships came and went from Marseille often. On June 7, 1903, the Liban departed from Marseille for another trip to Bastia. It is hard to know how many passengers she had on board. They were never properly counted. But the most common estimate was that between the passengers and crew, there were most likely around 200 to 240 people on board of the vessel as it left. They would still be within sight of Marseille when their voyage would come to an abrupt end. Another Fresnay Company postal vessel, this one the steamship Insulaire, was coming around Mary Island to reach the port of Marseille as the Liban departed. The smaller 934-ton Insulaire was returning from her regular voyage to and from Toulouse. The day was a calm one. There was nothing in the conditions that hinted at danger, or would lead either crew to be more alert than normal. Unfortunately, no fog or storm was needed. Mary Island would hide the two ships from one another. Captain Lacotte of the Liban had no knowledge of the danger that his ship was in. He was below having his dinner in the company of the passengers. The person in command on the deck was Quartermaster Saint Andrea, who had to make a decision about what needed to be done when to come face to face with another ship unexpectedly. Both ships blew warnings on their whistles, which were heard below, and alerted everyone on the ship that something was wrong. In a moment of seeming panic, it was found that San Andrea had turned to port, even though, based on the rules of the road, he ought to have turned to starboard to avoid the other vessel. The Insular, under the command of Captain Arnaud, also turned to port, and soon the Insular was on the port side of the Liban, with the Liban coming towards it still. Sandwiched between Mary Island and the Liban, the Insular had no means to escape, and they were forced to turn to starboard to keep off of the rocks of Mary Island. Both ships were traveling at full speed. The collision at this point was unavoidable, and the bow of the Insular plunged into the side of the Liban near the bow. The whistles had already brought many people, including Captain Lacotte, rushing to the deck. It was later claimed that though he reached the deck before the two ships struck, and he had time to give several orders, but it was said that at no point did he give any orders to even attempt to change the course of his vessel before the ships collided. The collision between the two ships caused alarm and panic among the passengers who were sitting at dinner. Captain Arnaud backed his ship slightly after the collision to assess the damage and take stock of what needed to be done next, while the same must have also occurred on board the Liban. The conclusions that the two captains reached, however, were dramatically different. Captain Arnaud found himself with a badly damaged bow, 
and he was taking on water. He stopped almost exactly where the two ships had collided, and began makeshift repairs to stop the water from gaining on them before they could reach Marseille, feeling that his ship was in serious danger. Captain Lacotte, on the other hand, found that the bow of his ship was taking on water quickly, and felt that his best chance to save the lives of his crew and passengers would be to ground his ship on the rocky shore of the Farallon Islands, which were the closest land. The passengers on the Libyan, who had been eating dinner peacefully only minutes before, had now rushed to the deck, and on finding that the bow of the ship was beginning to get lower in the water, they all rushed to the stern of the vessel. The collision had also not gone unnoticed by other vessels. The pilot boat Belchamp was about two miles away when the two ships had struck one another, and it immediately headed towards the accident to see if they could be of any assistance. The insular was no longer nearby, and therefore no assistance could be sought there. Captain Arnaud, feeling that his ship was still in grave danger, had ordered that the insular head towards Marseille very slowly to prevent any additional strain on the ship. He did take a moment as they passed the Balkan, another Fresne ship, to tell them what had happened and send them towards the Lieben in case their help was needed. Captain Lacotte would say that as he headed towards land with the hope of grounding his ship, he also prepared lifeboats, but Captain Matai, a merchant captain who was on board as a passenger, would disagree. He said that it was not until the Libyan was clearly sinking rapidly that the lifeboats were prepared, and by then it was too late. According to him, there had been no precautionary measures taken while the ship made its mad dash towards the Farallons, and that some of the passengers had entreated the captain to take other measures, only to be ignored. The Libyan would remain above the water for about 17 minutes after the collision, before her bow would plunge almost entirely under the water, and only a moment later the ship would sink entirely, with little time to react. The passengers taking shelter at the stern of the vessel, where it seemed safer, proved to be a fatal mistake. The stern had an awning over it, and as the ship suddenly sank, the people who were sheltering at the stern of the vessel were unable to escape from under the awning. As the ship sank, the masts struck the water, causing eddies which made it almost impossible for the boats of the Belchamp, which was now nearby, to get close enough to save anyone. Even as the masts struck the water, Passengers and crew alike were clinging to the masts and rigging desperately for safety, making a terrible scene that horrified those on board of the Belchamp. To add to the horror, as Libyn sank, the boilers exploded, adding to the chaos of the rescue efforts and throwing people into the sea. Only one boat got away from the Libyn before she sank, and only a few people were able to get into it before it left the ship, including Captain Matai. He would say that the reason they were not able to get the other boats away on time was because of defective fittings, which rendered the other lifeboats useless, even when Captain Lacotte did finally order them to be swung out. The only lifeboat to leave the ship headed for the safety of Belchamp, where they were taken on board. The Belchamp, meanwhile, launched three boats to begin to pull people out of the water. The Balkan, which had also reached the scene, also joined in launching boats to try to save as many people as possible, as did the nearby Austrian steamship the Rakozzi. Though the rescue ships worked quickly, there was a limit to what they could do. Many people had been lost either in the boiler explosion or trapped under the ship's awning. Many of the people who they were able to save were badly injured from the ordeal. Just as reports of how many people were on board differed, so too did the reports of how many were saved. The lowest estimate of those lost was 97, while some other estimates placed it as high as 187. The public was quick to point out that of the crew, only three people were lost, and a majority of the victims of the disaster were the women and children who had been on board. 
Of course, some of this could be attributed to the fact that the passengers had been sheltered at the stern of the vessel in perceived safety while the crew had not, but there would be much more serious accusations. A doctor would claim that on examining the victim's remains, they showed marks of violence, and there were stories from the survivors that said that the crew had prioritized saving themselves and had beaten back any of the passengers who tried to head towards the boats. It was an allegation that was never officially ruled on, but it did not help the public outrage that was directed at the Fresnay Company. The French government said that they would do everything possible for the families of those who had been lost and the survivors, while the city of Marseille announced that it would pay for all of the funerals of the victims. Even while rescue work was still ongoing, the rescue ships had already begun the sad work of recovery as well. But soon divers would have to be employed to gather the remains of those who had been trapped on the Liban as it went down. The Pitolino brothers, the sons of a famous recovery diver, as well as known recovery divers in their own right, were selected for the job. The Liban was a challenging job, no matter how experienced the family of divers were. It had sunk in deep water, and the high pressures around it meant that the divers working on the recovery efforts could not remain underwater for longer than 20 minutes. The working conditions would eventually lead to tragedy. One of the divers signaled to be brought up to the surface, and was brought up holding the remains of a child, but he himself was barely conscious. Almost as soon as his helmet was unscrewed, he passed away due to the extended period of time he had spent working the wreck. The hard work of the divers, at the risk of their own lives, soon had the population of Marseille full of praise. The same could not be said of the public sentiment towards the Fresnay Company, which was generally blamed by everyone for the disaster. Two of the directors of the Fresnay Company made the mistake of attending a funeral for five of the victims of the disaster to offer their sympathy, as did many of the dignitaries of Marseille. Most of the speeches at the funeral passionately blamed the Fresnay Company with such vehemence that one of the directors felt compelled to step forward only to be met with such hostility that they, as well as the city dignitaries, felt compelled to depart the funeral. Captain Lacotte, Roland, who was the second captain of the Liban, and Quartermaster St. Andrea would all soon face trial on charges of manslaughter, as would Captain Arnaud, though the charges against Roland were soon dropped. For Quartermaster St. Andrea, it was found that he had turned to port when he should not have, but that was not considered a career-ending offense, and he was fined a single, symbolic franc. Captain Arnaud had faced great public wrath for failing to help the people on board of the Liban, but the courts took a more merciful view of this. It was true that it turned out that the insular was not so damaged as to be in immediate sinking condition, but it also seemed that Captain Arnaud had acted in the belief that it was, and considering the circumstance, this was understandable. The only fault that the court found in his actions was that it was felt that even if he felt the need to depart immediately for Marseille, he still could have launched a couple lifeboats to help the Liban before he left. He was also fined a single symbolic franc. The court saved its full ire for Captain Lacotte. To risk everything on the idea of safely grounding the Liban on the rocky Farallones, rather than taking any other safety measure, was a great flaw in judgment. The court ruled that many more lives would have been saved if he had chosen instead to launch lifeboats and do an orderly evacuation, one that could have been aided by nearby ships if he had remained where the collision had occurred. He was also faulted for not thinking of cutting down the awning when he saw people sheltering at the stern, for failing to make a distress signal so that even more help could come quickly, and for not ordering the lowering of ladders so that people could climb down into the rescue boats that had started to gather around the sinking ship. His master's certificate was suspended for three years. The Fresnay Company as a whole was also not free of blame, according to the statement made by the court. They could not say anything about whether or not the safety equipment was sufficient on the ship, 
do to Captain Lecotte, not putting it to sufficient use to test it, though they did make note of the passengers who claimed that the boats had not been able to launch when it was attempted. The court did state that 18 months before she sank, the Libyan had underwent major repairs, and that at the time, she had been inspected and given a top rating in all regards, including safety. Of course, the court said, this did not mean that the equipment had been maintained during the time that followed, but since Captain Lacotte had waited so long to swing out the boats and had not distributed life belts at all, the court declined to rule on the matter. Instead, they focused on the Fresnay Company not setting separate routes for its shipping going in and out of Marseille, which would have prevented the disaster entirely. Having fallen out of favor with both the courts and the public in general, the valuable postal contract between Marseille and Corsica would be taken away from the Fresnay Company. The Fresnay Company would also be found civilly liable for what had occurred between its two ships, even after a lengthy appeal process. The Fresnay Company would not be able to avoid the blame and the public rage directed at them over a disaster that could have been mitigated so easily and in so many ways. For more information, please see the Bloomberg Daily from June 8, 1903, or see other sources in the description below. Thank you for listening. Thank you for visiting the Shipwreck Archives. See you soon.